I'm Holly. And I'm Bridget. And this is Girls Next Level. (laughs) Welcome back to Girls Next Level, everybody. Today we are covering the episode 80 is the new 40. And this was really the second half of the one hour special that started off Girls Next Door season two. It's Hef's whole birthday thing. I'm excited about this episode. I know. It's just like there is a lot going on. Yeah. And it's interesting too because um, it makes more sense that it was a one hour special now that I'm rewatching it Mm -hmm. because um, we were talking about how in the first half, like Kendra's not in it that much. Like they're kind of struggling to give her. Well, she's in it a lot, but it's like not substance stuff. Like I feel like they're filling her plate for her. Yeah. They're trying to push it. But I feel in like in the second half, there's way more storyline because her mom comes and Mm -hmm. everything. So there's there's way more storyline um, for her in this one, and I'm barely in it. Obviously, I have my um, routine at the end, yeah. But I feel like the rest of the episode that I'm I'm barely in it. So it starts out opening scene, rolling hills of the mansion, slob on my knob like corn on the yeah. Cob. But before. So anyway, so if there's any confusion out there, because I was confused then, I'm confused, I was confused yeah. now, but we got it, got it straightened out now. So then, okay, yeah, then we're in the office. It's it's Kendra and Hef and Dick Rosenswag. Have we described who Dick Rosenswag is before? I don't think so. He was like, what would you call him, the president of Playboy? What I was think his? so. He was high up in the company. Yeah. And his office was at the mansion. Um, You never really saw his office because it was past where Norma works. It was like in another room past that. And we never really went in there or very rarely. shack style. Yeah. It was kind of cool though. It was like circular. It had Mm -hmm. its own bathroom, I think, back there. Didn't it have like a really 70s bathroom? Yeah. It had one of those bathrooms. There were like three of them I can think of in the mansion that were like just time capsules of course the first one I'm thinking of is like the attic one about yeah Hef's room and then there was that tiny little one in the game house that felt like an airport yeah Not airport but like if you're picturing like an airplane bathroom and like a private jet from the 70s that's what it would look like yeah it was like a motorhome almost like mm-hmm. the sink was so tiny the toilet was so tiny and the shower wasn't separate from the bathroom it was just part of the bathroom yeah like so weird yeah there was just like a drain in the floor mm-hmm. it was very weird and very styled 70s but anyway so it's Kendra Hef Dick Rosenswag and Norma and Kendra starts doing the lyrics to three six mafia song slob on my knob but anyway I think the scene is funny and then there's some sort of lyric about a train because in commentary you say what's a train and Kendra's like what like running a train on somebody yeah or but- human centipede what human centipede what shut is- the f- up do not tell me right now you don't know what a human centipede is okay I don't. Girl, I don't. What is it? Do I have to explain this on the pod? I don't Trigger know. Trigger warning. I mean, I think everybody knows what I Is it different than a train? Yes. Oh, I don't know. Well, there was a horror movie called Human Centipede. Yes. And it was a mad scientist who would like sew a human mouth onto a and make like a long centipede out of it. Ew. So foul. Okay, so that's what you're talking about, the movie. Yeah, but it's known as a thing, Human Centipede. Okay, I thought it was like a sex thing. Somebody got, I mean, maybe it was some people. <laughs> Somebody got a tattoo of a human centipede once I saw it. Ew. Like online or something. Ew. Okay. It's interesting, too, because in, in the commentary, remember how we were talking about how you were like really steamrolling the commentary mm-hmm. like in the first episode? I feel like Kendra caught onto that and she's like trying to do it now, which is weird because she usually doesn't talk that much about like in the commentary yeah she usually didn't care about commentary like every other time she had to try to dominate but commentary she didn't care well in this episode she is interesting um speaking of song lyrics before we move on I wanted to license the song come on to my house from the tv show for this podcast yeah and uh they very much ignore me they probably think I'm broke but whatever but I probably wouldn't want to budget the money for it anyway because it is quite expensive because it was written by 
two people, but it was one of the guys was like the guy who created the chipmunks, Alvin and the chipmunks. He was Dave of the chipmunks. And it's just an expensive song. But ironically, the part of the song I want kind of has nothing to do with the original come on to my house. Cause like, I don't care about the lyrics for the podcast. I just want that part that goes near, 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 near when they right. got to commercial, which was done by a group called nasty tales. But I would have to pay for like the original song if I use that. So it's right. like a whole convoluted mess. But anyway, it's like tens of thousands of dollars to get it. And I thought it was interesting that Kevin was willing to pay for that for girls next door rather than, Oh, pays cast. Right. And use like a generic song or have a song made. It's interesting. Right. Well, I'm surprised he didn't have a song made. I like it. There was, must have been. Because he was cheap. He must have had a special affinity for that song. I think so too. Because we know like Kevin, the producer, was really attached to certain pop culture things. And he, but he was also very cheap. Like when I was in Peep Show in Vegas, that was a huge part of my life. It was a huge part of what my spinoff Holly's World was built around. But you never actually saw the show on Holly's World because he was too cheap to pay for it. Because it was an actor's equity show, meaning it was like theater union. So you would have had to pay a certain amount because right. like all the actors get like a little bit or whatever. But the director of the show kept saying, oh, I talked to equity. They're going to cut him a deal. He just has not taken them up on the deal because he was just too cheap to pay for it. And then he kept telling me it was too expensive, which sucked because I felt like that was a really cool visual show. And even to get like a few snippets of it would have really added yeah. to just the world and the depth of that show. But I wonder why he was obsessed with Come On To My House. Like, is it because of the chipmunks? Is it because of Rosemary Clooney? Was it a song he remembered from his childhood? I have no idea what the significance was. If he liked the chipmunks, that would be interesting because when we started, or when I was watching this for YouTube and I started to get into like the food shaming thing and how they try and focus food on you like it's a personality trait. I'm like, wait, is he making us the chipmunks? Oh, because you know how Theodore was like food was this one personality trait. And then you have Simon that's kind of like quiet and nerdy. And then Alvin's like the attention hog. Interesting. We're, we're the chipmunks. We were totally the chipmunks. Yeah. The chipmunks. <laughs> uh-huh. OK, so next scene is the rooster crowing. They're trying to say it's a crack of dawn. Did at we the mansion. have a rooster at the mansion? No, I mean, we had peacocks. Peacocks. We have roosters at my ex-husband's house. So it's kind of getting it confused because I have a lot of memories of like hearing roosters in the morning or whatever. But yeah, I didn't remember. where. I mean, the from. peacocks are just as loud as the roosters. Oh, and they start going off yeah. too. So um, and they do a montage of what like the morning of a party looks like at the mansion. Animals are being herded and there's lots of food preparation. But one of the food preparations, did you see the bowl of chips and dip? I don't think I focused in on it, but I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Oh my God. It was this giant platter and a round platter. And in the middle of it was this giant bowl and it looked like it had like onion dip in it. And it had a giant ruffle sticking right out of the middle of the dip. And then all these ruffled chips all around it. And they were walking past the camera with it. And I was like, wait a minute, let me have some of that. I know the exact (laughs) onion dip you're talking about. Oh, so good. It's so good. The outdoor kitchen is nuts. Like I wonder what they put there now, now that they're remodeling that property. It looks like they're building something over it. I would get rid of the outdoor kitchen though too. Wouldn't you? Like I can see why they had it when it was the Playboy Mansion because you're doing so many huge events out there that you're basically also a catering company. Like that was the side hustle of the mansion. Well, (laughs) I think, don't you think that that was Hef sort of being cheap? Like he didn't want to like do construction on the house and extend the kitchen. So they just put in like an outdoor one. Maybe, but I also felt like maybe working. Well, I don't know because maybe it got really hot out there too. I don't know. But I also felt like maybe it was kind of nice to get out some fresh air or because if you're like barbecuing a lot, not that you couldn't like build in a filtration system in the house, but yeah, I don't know. Like I can see why they had it at the time, but I would totally do something else with it if that were my house. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if it's a, if it's a private home, cause this was more commercial. Yeah. So if it's a private home, you wouldn't need all of that. It looks like they did build something over it though. Like they didn't just like clear it out and make it outdoor space. Yeah. So I wonder what's there. I don't know. I heard he was redoing the whole kitchen, so. I mean, I would. Right. Yeah. And it has Alan answering the phone. Mm -hmm. And party preparations are starting. There's just lots of hustle and bustle in this scene. 
In an interview, Holly says, today is the big day. It's Hef's 80th birthday party. It's a big deal for Hef because not only is it a big round number, but he is really happy with everything going on in his life right now. So he wants to celebrate. And that comment really rang true for me. Like I feel like Hef was so happy, almost giddy on a daily basis at this point in his life. I think it's 100% true as well. And I, but I also think me saying it, I'm being very purposeful saying it and putting it out there because I felt like for so many years living there, people tried to make us feel like we were not part of the good years or I don't know how to explain it. And Hef always had a habit of in interviews, no matter what period of time he was in or what was going on in his life, anytime he was interviewed, you'd go, well, well, this is just the best time in my life. Even if it wasn't. A, it's kind of a healthy attitude to always think you're in the best time of your life. That's kind of cool. Yeah. But then I'm like, are you a bullshit? But then sometimes going back, because I did this too when I was at the mansion, like let's say he was married and miserable, but he's trying to make it work. And he doesn't necessarily need the outside world to know he's miserable at the time. So I guess I can see him saying. Well, and I think a lot of people do that every day. People say, how are you doing? And you could be having the worst day of your life and be like, oh, I'm good. Yeah. You know, like you just kind of. Truth. Yeah. But I really felt it at this point. I really felt like he meant it. I really felt like I felt it from him, like that he really enjoyed his life. He really enjoyed the three of us. He really enjoyed the situation and and how everybody was with each other. I felt like he really enjoyed the show and, and the being opportunities. Relevant again, because of the show. Yeah, I feel like he really, really was happy in this time period. Oh, I think so too. And so I really felt that. And then um, they zoom in on the invitation for Hef's party and it's on my desk and there's a p- that pink Playboy mug I was talking about. I was going to say, yeah, your mug has made I an appearance. Broke. Damn it. But anyway, it's just so cute. And did you notice what's next to it though? I mean, nobody else would know what this is or anything, but I noticed that I have all of the little tiny essential fragrance oils lined up because we are actively trying to do our fragrance line. Oh yeah, so we were allowed to sign with a management company right before season two, but this was the same management company that did like the estate of Marilyn Monroe and Betty Page, and it was very tied in with Playboy. So when I say allowed to have management, it was really like Playboy management still controlling. (laughs) Yeah, it was was still that. But we did stuff like we sold like roses that had like pictures printed on it. That's so weird too. I feel like that's such a weird thing to sell. Well, it wasn't anything that any of us, I mean, they sold decent actually. They would use us as the guinea pig for Marilyn Monroe stuff. Like he would be like, oh, I have this person who wants to develop a Marilyn Monroe fragrance, but I don't know if we want to do it. So let's guinea pig it on you guys first and see. And same thing with the roses. They want to do Marilyn Monroe roses. So they would like guinea pig it on us first. I feel like we need to describe these roses a little bit for people because they were actually fresh roses that you would order and be delivered to you. But on the petals, and I don't even know how they did this, Mm -hmm. they would print a picture of our faces on them. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was so goofy. It's really weird. It, it's weird because I, I feel conceited offering something like that. But it wasn't our idea. No, no. But we're doing the fragrance line. Mm-hmm. And so, but in order to like come up with your fragrance, they give you like, you like you go through a list and you tell them all of the different types of scents that you like. And then they give you all of those. And then you kind of like figure it out from there it's like narrowing it down like what your favorite scents are and what's mm-hmm. gonna go with what so anyway I have all those little tester bottles sitting up there yeah it's in the works yeah okay then it shows Hef walking across the circle in the front to the front door again breaks the fourth of home because he waves to the camera yeah and um and I just thought it was interesting to note too that Hef is the only one that is allowed to get away with this. And I feel like they're sending a message here that Hef is aware that there's an audience and a camera, but we were too stupid. Yes. And, yes. I, and I hate that because I loved breaking the fourth wall. And I, I feel even to this day, like if I'm talking to camera YouTube style or like this, like I feel like I'm fine. I'm able to be myself. But even now I can't break the habit. Like if I'm doing like a confessional style interview, I'm not myself at all. I go straight into robot mode. They let me break the fourth wall once later in this series, and that was it. But I wish I could have done it more. Mm. Sad. I like doing it, too. I think it's cute and quirky and fun. Like, not 
not all the time, but just mm-hmm. every once in a while, like giving the camera a little wink or like just knowing that you're letting them in on something kind of thing. Yeah, but I feel like you're 100% right. Like Hef's allowed to know there's an audience and there's people out there, but we're not. And it also ties into what I was saying at the end of our last episode that it's Hef is the only one who's allowed to like be happy in the universe. All of us are always kind of striving for something else. Like I'm unhappy because I don't have him to myself. You're unhappy because you really want to bite a cake, but you're trying to get in shape. Kendra's unhappy because her present isn't measuring up. But Hef is just having the most blissful time of his life. Anyway, Hef walks into the backyard and he's talking to Hank about the neon tables. And I think this scene is 100% set up. Me too. I was going to ask you that because I feel like Hef had been doing these parties for so many years that it was on autopilot and he trusted the staff to do what they did. And if there were ever any changes to the decor or anything, Hank would have just walked up to Mary's office and told him what they were going to do. Yeah. Like he's not going out there the day before like, oh, we know this and we know this. That's totally set up. They're, yeah. And I think another thing it's indicative of is season one was a huge success and now Hef is willing to give time to oh. be in a scene. Now he wants to be in the show. I see, yeah. Because Hef's like worried about the neon tables and will that supply a lot of color? And Hank says, yes, it'll supply a tremendous amount of color. You'll not be disappointed in it. But it was totally a made-up scene. Like Hef would never be involved in the neon tables out there. so funny. <laughs> So the next scene, um, Holly's talking about these really great invitations that fold out. I forgot they folded out like that. Yeah, it was a whole like retrospective of Hef's life, like all these photos of him from different eras. And do you notice I'm using we again? I'm like, we sent out these great invitations. I can't stand it. (laughs) (laughs) So there's like 10 photos of Hef throughout his life. Disclaimer, I had nothing to do with invitations, (laughs) but we sent them out. (laughs) Um, and then it cuts to my room and it shows me opening it all the way up and showing it off. And yeah, I, it's in my scrapbook and I mm-hmm. pulled it out, but I totally forgot it did that. Um, and you say that there's so many celebrities that are going to be at Hef's birthday party. And then did Hef's- you hear the weird voiceover? No, what? It was like cut really weird. It's like you say something and they shove my voice in there, shoehorn it in. So many celebrities at Hef's birthday party and then it cuts straight to Kendra saying something. And I think they did that because at the last minute they wanted to portray Kendra as being so excited about what celebrities are coming. Because that's how, I mean, A, she was, but they also like to portray her that way. And I think that was the only soundbite they could find last minute because it goes straight from you talking to like a sentence of my voice straight to Kendra it's really weird and wow. choppy um and Kendra says it's going to be huge because three six mafia is going to perform and a whole lot of other shit <laughs> what's the whole lot of other shit and then they abruptly cut her off yeah <laughs> well I think that she was trying to say that there's so much going on but I think that she didn't that three didn't six know. mafia yeah. was the main thing that she knew about but she didn't know about the rest of it then it cuts to my interview and I say it's going to be bigger than usual there'll be like a thousand people there and I'm so excited about it and um, in commentary, Kendra says, I was so excited about this night. And I say, I was so nervous about this night. I bet. So then the next scene, Holly says, a big group of playmates from the 70s are coming to Hef's 80th birthday party. So I decided to invite them up for a luncheon. And then you walk down the hall and plop down in Mary's office. And then Holly says, a few of the playmates that are coming to her luncheon are some she has never met. So she looked them up in the playmate book, which is kind of like a, a index of playmates. And it totally is. Yeah. Like, was it that big giant one? Yeah, they had this coffee table book that had a picture of every playmate ever. I still have that book. It's huge. It's their centerfolds, right? No, that's a different one. The oh. Playmate book was, it was more the size of like a normal coffee table book and it had all kinds of pictures. Like some of them had their actual centerfold pictures, but it would just be like, oh, this is Miss So-and-so and some picture and a little something about her. Okay. So when you said you were going to look it up, I totally thought it was that big book of centerfolds because when I was home, I also saw that book and it is so heavy. It's hard. I'm like 20 feet in the air up on this little scaffolding mm-hmm. and I'm trying to move that and it's so heavy. I'm like, this it's crazy. <laughs> I have the miniature one up there. But oh, there's a miniature one there too? There is, yeah. Oh my gosh. One of my things I was going to do while I was at the mansion was trying to get as many women to sign it 
as possible. Oh, yeah. I, I think I got like three signatures. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be an easy thing to give up on. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, never mind. Who cares? So okay. I'm down in Mary's office. I'm wearing my wig, a vintage Hef's birthday Olympic shirt. Because we talked about that last episode, how back in the 70s, Hef had a birthday Olympics. And somehow I got like a vintage t-shirt from it. And my Frankie B shorts, which I wish they still made because I love those so much. They were cute. And I'm talking to Mary about the 70s Playmate luncheon I'm going to have. And then we're just going through like the Playmate book. And keep in mind, like this was probably a pretty long scene that they filmed that they cut down to super short. Yeah. And Mary and I are talking about all kinds of different things. And we're not talking about anybody in particular in any way, shape or form. And Mary goes... You know, some of have breast implants that are so bad they point all different ways. But she's not talking about anyone specifically. This is very different than those scenes where they have like Hef looking over a particular centerfold's layout and going, oh, it looks like she's put on a lot of weight. This is Mary talking about in general. But I was shocked by this scene, not because you guys were talking about that, but I was like, wait, they did boob jobs in the 70s? There were different types of boob jobs. There, it used to, first it was injections, like they would inject silicone into the breasts, and that ter- would turned out horribly. I would think. I think Linda Lovelace talks about it in her book, but I don't know how common breast implants were in the seventies. I think in the eighties, that's when it really started to pop off. That's what I was going to ask. Mm-hmm. When did it start? I, I don't even know. But I don't even know in this conversation if Mary's even talking about the seventies in general. But I. I don't take offense to it because I think it's so nonspecific. Like, I guess if you're watching this scene and assuming she's talking about the women I'm inviting to luncheon, but she's absolutely not. Yeah. And I don't think any of those women that I know of had breast implants back then. (laughs) Yeah. And then you say, but the biggest difference between girls who pose then and girls who pose now is what we call the fur bikini. The fur bikini. Mary and I were developing our own language. The fur bikini was what I call like a full pubic hair bush. Yeah. Yeah which was very common in the 70s. And I always have wondered, like, was it less embarrassing to pose nude back when pubic hair was a thing? Because you're covered. Right. I get that. In commentary, I ask you, why would it be easier? Because I was thinking, too, that it would be weird how you're groomed down there. Like, there had to be, like, a standard. Like, Mm -hmm. there's standards now, kind of. And there were standards when we were there. There had to have been standards, like, kind of like how you have your hair, whether it's long or triangle or all over. Like, there had to be grooming standards, I would think. Yeah, like, I guess the hair is, like, a whole other thing you could be self-conscious of. Yeah. But you're not having your whole, like, labia out. Right, that is true. Well, and then Kendra says, well, they could have lice. Ew. Well, that was the thing. It was called crabs. Ew, ew, like you don't hear like ew. in our generation about crabs because everybody was shaving. But that was a thing back in the day is people would get pubic lice called crabs. And that was like a big concern in like the STD or, or like the world of sexually active young people is like, are you going to get crabs? That's so disgusting. <laughs> and then in commentary, I say, I wish I could have gone and I couldn't remember why I couldn't go. But then later I say it's because I was rehearsing. I had a rehearsal. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. And it wasn't just totally my schedule. Like Catherine Delish was choreography and training me and everything. So I had to also work with her schedule. So if she had to do it at that time, you know, Mm -hmm. I had to do it at that time. But and then um, so I say I was really bummed that I couldn't go to the luncheon. And then Kendra says she's glad she didn't go in commentary. What does that mean? I don't know. She said that she doesn't have anything to say to anyone there. That's what she says in commentary. And I just thought, uh, okay, this this doesn't surprise me because I do know that that's the way she uh-huh. is to things. But it surprised me that she said it on, well, we're not on camera, but in commentary. Yeah. Me I was too. like, what? wait, she's being like, that is her being the most real. Yeah, 100%. That I have seen so far. 100,000%. That's true. And uh, but I was like so shocked because in my first my first reaction is, oh my god, that's so rude. Mm-hmm. Like but then my second reaction was, wait, but that is so it's absolutely how she would have felt and mm-hmm. she's actually being real and honest about that yeah. right here. So I thought that was really interesting. Then in the next scene, it's out front of the mansion, zooms in on Kendra's room. She's sitting in her bed talking to her mom on the phone, and she asks her mom, "Do you know what I'm doing for Hef's birthday?" And she says, oh, you got that picture, didn't you? That black and white thing. And then Kendra says, Holly and Bridget have all these cool ideas. And I'm like, 
boring. And Patty says, so they have a couple more years on you. In five years, you'll have more ideas. And Kendra's quiet for a long time to the point where her mom's like, hello. And then she says, word. How do you feel about Patty saying that? I felt like that was trying to dig at us. Like I felt like it was being snarky. I felt like it too. Like I know there's a lot of people who will watch that scene and think nothing of it. But I feel like it is snarky and I feel like it's kind of like age shaming a little bit. Like, yes. oh, well, they've been there a long time. But this had nothing to do with age or how no. long we'd been there. Kendra had already been there for two years. So it's not like she had no idea what, what parties were like or what people got have for mm-hmm. birthdays or any kind of holidays. Two years is not a small, that small of amount of time to like kind of catch on to things. It yeah. has to do with your personality and your creativity and thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness is exactly what I was going to say. That's- and again, there's nothing wrong with her gift. Like I thought her gift no. was great. And you know, nobody's even Hef is not going to judge. This is kind of something the show is pushing to kind of give her a plot line. But yeah, I was kind of offended by Patty's snarkiness too, because we're not coming up with this stuff only because we've been there five years. Like we were doing creative things from the second we landed there. Yeah. I was doing creative gifts like that before I was even at the mansion. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a personality thing. It's not. And again, there's nothing wrong with her gift and no one was saying there was, but it was like, it was like they have to make it look like hers doesn't compare. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they're doing that. Um, And then I also think it's rude though of Kevin to leave that in. It's almost like he was getting a kick out of a little dig on us. Well, I think Kevin got off on a lot of digs and he got off on, you know, he saw, you know, how ambitious we were and how important certain things to us were. And I think he always kind of got a kick out of like handing things to Kendra. Like, oh, he, 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 Holly and Bridget try so hard and Kendra doesn't give a shit, but like, let's elevate her. And we weren't necessarily like steaming or mad about it at the time, but I think he wanted that. Yeah. And it's like a good example of how I always say about reality TV like people always ask would you ever do a re- another reality show and I'm like no and one of the big reasons no is because fake drama turns into real drama every yes. reality show needs drama like you could go into it with like the biggest pact with your friends or the cast or your family or whoever but that fake drama that's being sown the whole time nobody's above that and it turns into real drama yeah cut to Kendra and I don't fucking speak today right Then the next scene is me walking out of the security office in a pink satin robe and some Playboy slippers (laughs) with Winnie in tow on a leash. And I'm walking over to the bunny house with Hank. And I ask, is the truck already over there? And he says it is because we are about to move that giant cake out of the Playmate house. I was so nervous watching this. You just feel like impending disaster is right around the corner. Yeah. So we have to move it from the Playmate house over to the mansion and then hide it like backstage somehow. And in interview, I say I had to go over to the other house and make sure the cake gets brought over and that they get both parts of the cake because it comes apart in two pieces and it was very stressful. And I can feel my nerves watching this scene. Yeah. Like I... My palms were getting sweaty. We walk into the bunny house and the cake is at the front door. And immediately I'm like, oh my God, the cake doesn't fit out the front door. Yeah. In commentary, we're talking about the icky chair that's on the porch. Do you remember that chair? I did not remember it it until I watched the scene. It was like moldy and gross, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was so bad. Yeah, it was like a wicker chair with Mm -hmm. like old fabric, like padding in it. And I think it at one point hung, like I think it was supposed to be like a swing. It was one of those 70s hanging chairs. And now it was just sitting on the ground collecting cobwebs webs and probably mold and just being gross gross. and we kept saying that needs to be thrown away and for the longest time they wouldn't do it for some reason there were hoarder vibes at the mansion and not just with hef like there's like i don't think hef was insisting they keep a random wicker chair outside the playmate house yeah i think it was maybe his hoarder mentality kind of trickled down a little bit to the point where people didn't want to throw away and do you remember when you would drive out the back gate at the mansion on the left hand side like sometimes the production trailer would be there but when it wasn't there there were just stacks and piles of like refuse yes and sometimes it'd be kind of covered with a tarp but it always looked very junky it was so disgusting I remember one time this was later when I was working at the studio I sent Rob Hilberger from PR called it the email of death I sent an email I forget to even who probably Mary Norma everybody and I was like you guys, a playmate was staying in the guest house the other night. Some random guest got in there. Somebody's going to be 
kicked if you don't put security at the door during the parties. This is ridiculous. And by the way, I had like a list of grievances and it was going down from like really serious stuff like the playmate safety down to like it kept getting less and less serious, the stuff I would list. And the other thing was like, and what is up with to the point where people are driving out the back gate and they're seeing a disgusting junk pile horde like I didn't know who I thought would listen to me but I had just had it <laughs> it was really bad really junky on both sides I thought because on one side you had like the whole maintenance thing which mm-hmm. I get but it's like a lot of tools and lumber mm-hmm. and like trash cans and just stuff and then on the left hand side you just had like all of this like extra shit I don't even know what it all was it was disgusting I think they did clean it up though after the email of death (laughs) which was nice speaking of rob hilberger we're gonna go get lunch oh my god how fun i bet he knows where some bodies are buried for sure (laughs) should i see if he wants to do an interview yeah (laughs) um we were supposed to do it last week but it got moved to this coming week so tuesday lunch okay so we're back in the bunny house there are a few mansion maintenance guys in there and hank says so do we have it figured out and they say yes And then they try to go through the doorway and I know it won't fit and there's scraping noises and some of these noises are fake, Mm -hmm. but still the anxiety is still there that it's going to be. And anyway, they ended up having to flip it sideways and take it out the giant slider. And did you notice they're moving it over? They're on the back patio and they're moving it over like this wooden like bench thing. And you and I went on Google Earth to see if they had demolished this house, which they have, like everything is cleared. But you can see a little speck of something in the dirt and it's part of that bench thing. That's like the only thing that's left. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. you guys, everything is gone. Even the pool that we loved so Mm -hmm. much is gone. So sad. Anyway, they're moving the... um, the cake out on the side and I was like getting worried because there's there's fragile things on there too there's like all those silk flowers and Mm -hmm. my sewing you know I don't know how strong that (laughs) that's all on there and there's all these crashing noises as it's loaded into the truck and focuses on my face looking very very worried and but then in commentary and I don't remember this we say that Hef almost catches us bringing the cake over to the mansion Ooh, scary yeah and then they have Hank say, wave goodbye. You'll never see it looking like this again. Do you think that was a voiceover? Yes. It sounded like a voiceover. That was yeah. funny. Okay, next scene. You're in front of the mansion. Holly's in front of the mansion greeting the playmates from the 70s. I see, I'll let you um, talk about who everybody is, but like obviously I see Allison Reynolds and Sandra Theodore. And then you say you're really excited to have the playmates from the 70s come up for lunch because you've always heard really crazy stories and wanted to see if they were true. Everyone's hugging and seems really happy to be there and to see each other. And you all enter the mansion. And then the first person to like say something is Monique St. Pierre. She's the November playmate from 1978. And she says, you know what I realized, Holly? And you say, what's that? And she says, for the first time, the first time she met Hef, he was actually younger than she is now. And another one chimes in and says, me too. I thought that same thing. That is so crazy. It's weird, right? Yeah. I was wondering when Hef comes down and says hi to everybody, do you think he recognizes each and every one of those playmates and knows exactly who they are? I'm kind of split. I don't know if he does or not. I would say Hef does not know who everybody is. I think he probably knows some of them. Like, obviously, Sandra. Right. Obviously, Allison, because she's there all the time. Right. And I think Monique has a very distinct look. But I think it probably takes a minute for him to catch up and remember everybody else, I would guess. I'm curious. I actually have no idea. Because that's a lot of people to remember over the years, and not everybody looks exactly the same over the years. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to it. I don't either. And then in commentary, you talk about Monique selling that dress. Yeah, she had this, one of her prizes for Playmate of the Year was, um, they used to give the Playmates of the Year, well, they gave it to two of them, a Bob Mackie dress. It was really beautiful. It was on the cover. And Hef gave me that for Christmas one year because she was selling it. It was so pretty. Mm -hmm, So pretty. And you say that you wore it in the Vegas episode, but it never made it on the show. Yeah, I did. I don't know if they showed it in the show or not, but there's pictures of it like in the Girls Next Door coffee table book and stuff. Oh, that's good. At least it got something. Mm -hmm. And then Allison repeats, he was younger then than we are now. Isn't that sick? The interview they cut to with me, the confessional interview is so bad. Like I'm wearing a fall and it's not blended into my hair. I look like I just rolled out of bed. The background is an absolute absolute mess which I'm shocked Kevin approved because he was so picky about interview backgrounds it just looks like 
disgusting. Like, I don't know what it was or how it got approved or what happened. (laughs) Weird. I have a hard time with this scene. Like when you said, I'm going to let you explain who everybody is. I didn't even write down who everybody was because it's kind of, I have bad feelings about it because a handful of these women are haters now. Haters. Oh. And yeah. Like, like we'll go on Facebook and rant and. Oh, uh, well, we don't have to get into their individuality then. There's a few people that I pointed out just when I saw it, that I wrote down who they are when I saw it come up mm-hmm. on the thing, but I don't know who most of them are. And then you say this group of women was put together by your friend Allison. And then it shows Allison and she's like ordering people around. And it says underneath her, Hef's former social secretary. I wonder what the dynamics between those women were back in the day. Like if we ever got Sandra on the show, I'd be so curious to ask her. Because the way it stands when we're having this luncheon, like Allison is the one who stayed there as a guest. Like she comes to every single thing. Yeah. So she's the one who's like, you sit here, you sit here, you sit here. Like kind of. And to be fair, she kind of was one of the hosts of it. Just because she was the one who was getting the guest list together and telling me like who the core crew was and stuff like that so it makes sense but on the other hand I wonder if there was a little bit of now I'm the queen bee around here I don't know maybe I'm wrong but that could be that's really interesting because watching this I very much got that feeling Mm -hmm. that that dynamic was going on yeah I don't know if that's what I don't either it's an interesting thought like it could have been because I mean back in the day Sandra would have been the main girlfriend and I like I said I don't know what the social dynamics were back then and I would love to ask but I imagine there might have been some other people in that group who maybe were the alpha at that time yeah so who knows I don't know yeah um and you say in an interview um when they were all here in the 70s they were all really good friends so it was kind of like a sorority coming together after all of these years there was bullying back then too though yeah I'd be interested but did we know about it then at this time I don't know if I knew about it at that time. I did know about it when I was there, though. And I do like that those women were all mature enough to come together at some point. I don't think they're all hunky-dory happy now. But um, I think there's been a lot of people who are mad at other people for speaking out about their experiences. Oh. But, um, yeah, she she had told me that they bullied Sandra. But I will give her this. She was mature enough to tell me that they bullied Sandra. And she very much took ownership of, like, why. Like, she very much understood why they did it and why it was immature. She said it was because it was her and these other women were like living at the mansion or staying there or whatever and they had run of the place and they saw that when Hef started to get serious about one person they felt really threatened by that and they thought oh we're not gonna have this place under our control anymore so they would like bully Sandra and try and make her feel left out or they would say things like Hef we want to watch a of like two guys tonight because that would be like a big novelty back then and she's like what's Hef gonna do have a date with one girl or hang out with a bunch of girls who want to watch a gay So they would like do stuff like that on purpose to like try and like block him getting serious with Sandra. That so is reminiscent, I feel like, of what was happening to us. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. And then you say, where's Sandra? And for so you guys know, Sandra Theodore was July uh, Playmate uh, 1977, it said. And you said, I saved a seat for Hef. I saved a seat for her by Hef if she wants it. And now I feel bad because I feel like I see her sitting down and she looks traumatized. Oh no. But that was not my intent. My whole thing was like I wanted to be gracious and like give her that spot back while she was there. And one of the main reasons I thought to do it is because I did not want a repeat of the Barbie thing. And I feel like even like I thought it'd be fun to get these women together because I'd always heard so many crazy stories about like what it was like. But one of the reasons I wanted to do this was to like kind of make right the Barbie situation. Even though the Barbie situation was in no way like my idea. It was like something Kevin was doing to us. Yeah. I'm like Let's do the positive version of that. Yeah. And then you say you were really excited to see Sandra because she was Hess's girlfriend in the 70s and she's like my 70s counterpart. And I feel like that's even more true today than it was then. A hundred percent. Like I can't say everything we experienced was the same because I feel like a lot of what she went through sounds rougher than what I had to deal yeah. with. But I do feel like we were counterparts for sure. Like I feel like we were very much on the same page as far as like you know, being in love and like wanting to do right by Hef and everything like that. And he just took advantage of that and just fucking ran with it. 
Yeah. One thing that I felt was kind of sad is they talk about not liking to look in the mirror. They don't like what they see. They don't recognize themselves. And I just felt really bad for that because they're, they're very beautiful women. I know. I thought they all looked great. And actually, that luncheon kind of gave me hope for the future because I'd been at the mansion for like four years at this point, And I'd gotten to a very depressed place of feeling like there's not going to be anything for me after this. So I just have to make the best of this situation. I felt like if I left the mansion, everybody would judge me I fall on hard times because I saw what happened to all the other girlfriends who like moved out or got kicked out in my early days but I saw these women come back up and they all looked you know happy and pretty and were driving nice cars not that driving a nice car is like the most important thing in the world but they all looked like they had good lives and had their shit together and I thought you know what this makes me feel a little bit better and like there's some hope out there yeah you said um you were really encouraged when you saw all the ladies from the 70s because they all looked amazing you're like phew there's hope for me in the future yeah (laughs) how old do you think they would have been at that time do you think they're in their 50s maybe I think so because they would have been like mid 20s in like the late 70s yeah so maybe like mid to late 50s Yeah, I think so. So then you talk about Patty McGuire being your dad's favorite playmate. And she was November 1976. And they show her centerfold. And I was thinking when they were showing that, that's one of those things that they never probably would have imagined. Like, oh, yeah. Would be on an international TV show. Yeah, that gave me the chills. Like in the 70s when they decided to pose, they thought people are going to see this for one month. And if they want to find it after, they have to go to a library. You and know. now here it is on Girls yeah. Next Door, blasted on E. National television. Yeah. and Probably barely blurred. Uh, well, it wasn't blurred, blurred on the DVD. on DVDs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't blurred on what I saw. And then they show Michelle Drake centerfold. She was May 1979. And she was shot out by the lions at the mansion. Mm-hmm. And then they talk about Mar- Marcy Hansen, October 1978. And you say you have to see her centerfold because she's wearing these clear plastic shorts. And then they show her centerfold, but that's not good enough. The camera zooms all the way in on her crotch. All the way in. Yeah, it's crazy. And I was like, okay, I got the full picture when it was just like the full, I got, yeah, I, I got the, that's all we needed. Yeah. We didn't need the zoom in on the fur bikini. No, and the plastic shorts. But on a positive note, I felt like she very much looked like Sarah Underwood. I was getting oh Sarah gosh, Underwood I'll vibes. I'll have to look at that again. Yeah. I was like, that's crazy. That's so funny. Not identical or anything, yeah. but I, I definitely, when they first showed her, I was like, oh my gosh, like that's the 70s version, version of Sarah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the plastic pants were fascinating to me because Playboy pictorials were so cookie cutter that I was always kind of fascinated by things that like were weird anomalies like the plastic pants that's not something you would think half would ever approve for a centerfold yeah or like it makes me think of like the Sharon Tate pictorial where she's posing with this really goofy actor being a vampire and it's so goofy or have you ever seen the clown playmate I want to say yes. I don't have a clear visual in my head, but I feel like you have definitely sent that to me. Yes, there was a playmate in the 80s and her actual job was like a circus clown and her centerfold's like normal looking or whatever, but like her, a lot of her small camera photos for the rest of her pictorial were her nude and she's fully in clown makeup. And I'm not talking about like sexy clown or edgy clown. I'm talking about like the big round, like Ronald McDonald looking. Oh my God. It was crazy. And I'm just kind of obsessed with like the weird anomaly Playboy pictorials that slipped through the cracks over the years. Yeah. Um, And like wearing the big shoes. She's like nude, and but she's like wearing the big clown shoes and clown makeup. I love the big shoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so then Allison says when she used to work with Tom Petty, she said he called Playboy Mansion the house that butts built. But I was like, huh? Why is it the house that butts built? I don't know, because I feel like when people think of Playboy, they think of boobs. Me too. Like everybody has a butt and like they don't like folk <laughs> not just women and they don't focus on butts necessarily in the magazine yeah. like I would be I would think it was the house that boobs or vaginas built like yeah you would think something feminine the house that butts built butts built I don't even get it 
You know what else is killing me in this scene? Is they're cutting in so many extra laughs. Like they're laying my laugh over a million times when I'm not really laughing. And it's just so obnoxious. Oh no, I didn't notice that. They do that to Kendra a lot. Not in this scene, obviously, mm-hmm. but in other scenes. Yeah, she'll be standing there with her mouth closed and I'll be like, ah ha ha. Yeah. You asked questions about Hef's previous parties and you were wearing the t-shirt that you talked about before from the Playboy Olympics. You said that they dug that out of storage. Mm-hmm. And somebody yells out, I won the vibrator relay. And then it cuts to show old fit- footage of the Playboy Olympics. Where they're like running with vibrators and they have to like balance a beach ball on the vibrator. And it's so funny that like they're okay showing that. But remember when we had the sex toy Tupperware party for your birthday? E was like, absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. You can't show that. Yeah, you're right. But I feel like if something is vintage, it's seen as like less threatening. Like if you see somebody in the 70s running across the lawn holding a vibrator, it's not as like sexually threatening as like contemporary women choosing to buy a vibrator. Interesting. And then Allison yells out that the best part was the naked lady with the huge natural boobs that came out. And then they show footage of her running out and lighting the torch for the Olympics. And Monique says, her boobs were bigger than my head. But when they showed the footage, I didn't think that they were big, Mm -hmm. good boobs, natural boobs, but I didn't think they looked like so crazy huge. I didn't think so either. I don't know, but I did think it looked painful. It did to look be painful. Running with boobs, with it did. Like I feel like I'd be bra. holding them as I ran. And was that the San Diego chicken in the background? Yeah. Why what would that be fuck? there though? I don't know. And awfully interesting that like a major league baseball mascot was like okay to be at a party at the Playboy Mansion with nudity and vibrators. And also, this was broadcast on ABC back in the day. No. Yes. No. Yes. How? They used to do all these Playboy specials on ABC, like Playboy's Roller Disco Party, Playboy's this, Playboy's that. And it was on ABC. And the guy hosting it, do you remember who that was? Because it was a guy who would come up to the mansion every once in a while. He wasn't like a super regular. I didn't even pay attention to who was hosting. Yeah. It was. He's the guy that announces, and now we're doing the vibrator Mm -hmm. at the very start of that clip, right? Have you ever seen the Playmate Olympics in the 80s? I don't know if they were on TV or if they were just for VHS, but those are a sight to see. It would be Playmate Olympics, but I swear they were feeding these people cocaine because the way they acted, they were so over the top hyper and crazy. I was like, oh my God. Oh uh, No, I don't think I've seen them. I mean, if anything, I've seen like clips of just Hef showing things or, but I don't think I've ever sat down and watched any of the Olympics. Playboy Olympics, that is. Yeah. And then it, this is funny because you say, in like 20 years from now, I'll be inviting Bridget and Kendra back and we'll be like, and then you say in like an old lady voice, remember back when? Oh, wait, I forgot what I was saying. Which is kind of <laughs> what we're doing right now. That's what I was thinking. I just never, I never thought it would be this. I thought it would be like a very staid luncheon at the mansion. At the yard. mansion, yeah. Yeah. And then in commentary, you talk about the reunion that we're going to have in 20 years. And you say that um, you're going to make a clip reel. And then you say you're going to add clips of the crazy girl trying to bite two shorts, but... So there was a girl running around at the party trying to buy it two shorts, but... <laughs> oh, I bet we have video footage of that. If I'm, I'm sh- saying I'm going to play a clip reel, it's probably on one of our party tapes that we yeah. have. Yeah, and then you say the other thing that's going to make the cut is Penny with her Paul Frank underwear in the in the camera lens. Do you remember she was wearing these Paul Frank underwear? I do remember that. And she puts her crotch right in front of the yes. lens and like does this like... Yeah, she's being so funny. Yeah, like um, pulsating move. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I still want this clip reel. It's 20 years. Let's go. I mean, we have the materials. We We could make it if we had time. So then here comes Hef walking in. And Deborah Jensen, she's January 1978, gives him a hug and a kiss and says, happy birthday. Everybody runs over to say hello. And um, Allison yells out, without this man, we would not be here. Which I think she's still standing on a soapbox yelling that somewhere. Yeah. (laughs) And then, but then I do have to give Hef kudos for this Mm -hmm. because he says, um, without you girls, and then Allison interrupts him, doesn't even let him finish and says, um, where would you be? And he said, I would be in Chicago, which is so true because people want to get their underwear in a bunch. Anytime I say anything, because they're like, you wouldn't be 
anywhere without Hef. But you know who else wouldn't be anywhere without all the women he put in his magazine? Yeah. Without this Marilyn Monroe picture? Right. Hef. Like, I don't care. Like, you can write all the Playboy philosophies you want. You can publish all the writers you want. Nobody gives a f- People care. And he was famous because of the naked women. Right. Right. Absolutely. So but it's a I two-way like, street, I feel like he... He is acknowledging that here, or yeah, he's trying 100%. to, but he's getting interrupted. But it's but. just like the haters don't acknowledge that. Right. Um, and then Allison says, well, it's not just a momentous occasion that we're all together, but come on, this is a big birthday and we all need to be here for Hef, which I thought was sort of weird because we are all here for Hef and, you know, but it was, it was very weird as if he's that being is- attacked or something and we need to be here for him. See, she's been ready. That's like what I was talking about. I don't remember, I don't remember where I said this, if it was on a slumber party or the main podcast, but I was talking about how people who are like so defensive of Hef, they're defensive because they've kind of been trained to be that way over the years because anybody in their life who hasn't gone to the mansion is asking about like, oh, what's that place like? And they're like, no, 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 no. It's great. And he's so great. So when you're, you've been in that mode for like 50 years or however long she's been going up there, you're ready to attack at any minute. Yeah. And Hef says, I feel younger in heart and mind than when I was 60, without question. The last handful of years are so are as good as they get. And a lot of that has to do with Holly. But again, like I really feel he's sincere in this. And now that you're pointing all this stuff out, because I thought that was a very nice, sweet moment too, and a very rare moment, because I, I felt like I'd been there for like four years and never really got acknowledged kind of a thing. But I think you're right. I think he's so happy at this point in his life that he's kind of at a place where he's like chilling out a little bit. He's able to admit that like, well, I wouldn't be anywhere without all the women in my magazine either. Mm-hmm. And then he says, oh, a lot of it has to do with Holly. Like, blown away like at the time and even now hearing it like it was so rare to be acknowledged like that by him no I believe that that was a hundred percent sincere and I I believe that that was genuinely how he felt at that time and what was happening I do believe that it was one of the that that era was one of the best times I think so too and you know what I see in the background what on the dessert table the HMH chocolate cake yes yeah because I'm gonna talk about it good yeah, I say in commentary that I came over to the luncheon just to steal some food. Another example that I'm not starving myself, <laughs> and I'm sure. And then I, I say, talk about the HMH chocolate cake, because I know I grabbed a piece. Yeah, and I love that you guys can see it in the background, because I you feel like even though it's blurry in the background, you can see how good it looks. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So then we cut to your bedroom and getting ready for the party was as fun as the party, I felt like. Oh, it's one of my, the things that I miss the most about Mm -hmm. the mansion. It was just such a good time of like camaraderie and ordering food and getting a little bit buzzed and just getting ready for the night. Yeah, all the girls getting together and just hanging out. Like it's fun getting ready with other girls, I think. Mm -hmm. Especially for a big event like that. And it shows um, you are, and I remember this every time, every time Laurent would get there. So he was working at the salon all the way up until he'd have to come to the mansion. So he had no time to eat between. Uh So every time he'd get to the mansion, he'd be like, I want the cheeseburger. And I asked him, because I'm always trying to learn French, how do you say cheeseburger in French? He goes, they don't have it. <laughs> yeah, they it don't exist, it. he says. Yeah, it don't exist. So funny. And um, it's him and his assistants. They're already curling extensions. And in interview, um, Holly says, it's fun getting ready for the big parties. Bridget Room is kind of headquarters for party preparations for hair and makeup. And it shows me getting my makeup done. And Kendra's getting her hair done. And then she says she has to before the party and you're in the background and you turn around like you've never heard such a thing (laughs) well I just I just it was random it was out of the blue I mean I'm not trying to be a prude or anything but I just think it's such a crass thing to say and in front of everybody you know what it reminded me of what it in the myspace days her myspace got hacked and she said it was because her password was and she found out that was a very common password that people use so a hacker just guessed that that was her password and got into her myspace wow (laughs) okay and then the phone in my room is ringing and stacy walks over and answers it she's like bridget's room and laurent bends over and kendra smacks his ass (laughs) 
<laughs> which I was just like, what? Random. Because if it were like the other way around, that is not okay. Yeah. So I'm just like, I don't know. I just like to point out that that would not be okay. Stacy tells Kendra, your mom is here. She's in the great hall. And Kendra says she needs to go and put her vibe way and Stacy's face after she says that is so funny and she's like so what do you want me to say and then no sooner does Stacy say that they're actually just like letting themselves right into my room yeah and um they they act like a creaking door there's no creaking door and then they put mm-hmm. the scary doomsday music and then Kendra's like going on and on like Kendra gets very like weird with her mom I feel mm-hmm. like and like roles sort of reverse which is very weird I don't know if they were playing this up for the camera or what but it was she like started freaking out about not wearing dark lipstick did you know that the first idea for Kendra's spinoff was her and her mom being single together the kitten and the cougar <gasps> no I that's did what not Kevin told know. me <laughs> I did not. I don't know if Kendra wanted to do it, but I think Kevin wanted to. Well, Kendra was already pregnant and getting married. But Kevin didn't know that. Yeah. He wanted the mom and the daughter living together and like both dating. And it was going to be the kitten and the cougar. I did not realize it was going to include her mom. I knew that he really wanted to do a spinoff of her dating, like Kendra out in the wild type thing. But I didn't know it included her mom. And then they cut back to Anastasia's chicken cutlet moment, which I thought was cute. Yeah. Well, okay, wait, before that, um, Patty tells Kendra, remember, you're taken and I'm not, which I thought was sort of weird. And Kendra looks pissed. Like she has like a grumpy face. Because I don't think Kendra thinks she's taken. No, (laughs) I don't think so either. And her mom whispers to her that she bought something. Like I couldn't tell what she was talking about at first. But then the friend chimes in and she's like, I'm going to have tatas tonight. And then um, then they cut to Anastasia's chicken cutlet. Mm -hmm. And... I just got this weird feeling right here that Kendra's mom saw the Anastasia makeover episode and wanted that for herself. Yes. Which they, of course, they end up doing with the unveilings episode in season four. Yes. But I never thought this before until I was rewatching this and she's talking about she got the cutlets like Anastasia Mm -hmm. and she went and got her makeup done like Anastasia. So this was like the soft version of that that she was trying to do. But then we actually do it in the show later. Yes. Well, I didn't even make the connection that Anastasia's episode and the unveilings episode were connected until recently when I did my YouTube rewatch I was like oh that's a redo of the Anastasia episode duh because it's like a family member getting a makeover before Midsummer Night's Dream I didn't realize it either until you mentioned it in the Anastasia episode Mm -hmm. so then Stacy's passing out jello shots and then Kendra starts screaming at her mom that you can't have jello shots and I just don't understand what's happening here she's like being so controlling of her mom you can't wear lipstick I don't want you wearing makeup you can't wear lipstick you can't you have to wear long shorts and a a a jersey you can't have jello shots like it's so weird to me do you think it's just playing into the gag of it all like Kendra's embarrassed that her mom's coming to the party I feel like it has to be yeah it has to be oh and no in interview I say Kendra's obviously very protective of her mom but I mean come on her mom needs to let go a little bit and just forget what Kendra's saying and then um Kendra asks her mom what she's wearing and Patty says sweats but she says it in a very yeah. you know way that you know she's yeah. not telling the truth and I, I yell out oh I don't believe her <laughs> and then Kendra says she's not gonna wear sweats and then Kendra says I have to go to the bathroom and she sneaks off to her room and then she starts going through her mom's bag which I don't know that was totally set up by production there's no and doesn't she like find the outfit really fast it's right on top when she opens it up it's right there yeah I feel like this whole scene was orchestrated because later we'll get into it when like Kendra's mom very conveniently finds her own outfit it's just like it's so set up. it's so like whoever's behind the camera or the field producer going open that drawer over there yeah (laughs) and Kendra finds the blue robe that her mom is gonna wear it's right on top in the Uh bag and then she's like oh hell no but it was like a robe like it was nothing like it was conservative for a playboy party yeah and she like stuffs it in a different drawer and hides it should we wrap up and we'll come back next week yeah so thank you for listening um, to our story of giant muffs and MySpace passwords. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Have an amazing week, you guys. Bye, guys. See you next week. For more content, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash girlsnextlevel.